Lovely, not at the Grout Herd House Museum, but home. And today's program, Early Farm and Craft Tools, is the fourth in this year's series of seven programs offered by the Wayland Historical Society. Upcoming programs are the Musicians of the Old Post Roads March Concert called Forgotten Voices on Sunday, March 13th and Historical Society members re receive reduced rate admissions. Um, next is Slavery in Sudbury with Jane Siaka in collaboration with the Wayland Free Public Library on Sunday, March 21st, also on Zoom. And lastly, Cemetery Markers Lost and Found on Wednesday, May 12th. You can view videos of past programs by going to our website, waylandmuseum.org. And when you're there, I encourage you to explore with abandon, without an agenda or a goal, as there's just tons of interesting material there to enjoy. And finally, if you're not already a member, join us to help preserve, interpret, and to share the history of the town of Wayland. You can do so online as well. Now for today's program with Jack Russell, I'll turn this over to Gretchen Schuler, fellow board member and technical Zoom Sorry. <laughs> in spite of herself. Right. Gretchen? Uh, thank you, Molly. That's great. You're welcome. A, a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Would everybody please mute themselves? Um, except for, I hope I won't mute here, otherwise we won't hear Jack. And um, if you want to pin Jack, you can go into the top of your um, of the box that has Jack, which is me right now, and there are little dots and you can push on the little dots and scroll down and there'll be something that says pin. And if you hit that, then he will fill your screen and that will be that. The other thing to do is to put it on speaker view rather than gallery view. Um, I think those are the housekeeping things. So about today's program, um, Jack Rushell, today's speaker, who we all know, is a, lo a longtime Whalen resident and member of the Whalen Historical Society. He's a graduate of Sterling College, where he majored in forestry and small scale farming. Through that educational program, he developed an interest in construction of post and beam barns and antique tools used to construct them and his passion for antique farm and other tools took off from there. Yeah. Yeah. Many of you know Jack as the garden shop manager and tool buyer at Russell's Garden Center. And before I turn it over to him, one other um, word of thanks to Annette for pulling everything together. And the other one is um, to Debbie and uh, Bruce who came and lent us their um, tripod and gave me a lesson on how to do this. So here we go, it's gonna be Jack's turn now. There you go. Uh, welcome. Um, this is my first time doing this, uh, or at least public speaking in a little while. So I've actually written down a few things on note cards, um, so I won't forget them. You know, important. Um, and what we're doing here. So this is early farm and craft tools. This talk could also be called "Things I Found in the Basement." Um, and you know, these are some really, really cool things we found in the basement. So I think it's worth that. Uh, in describing myself, I would have to call myself an enthusiastic amateur. Um, you know, we're just going to do a brief introduction. Please are we going to be here too? In the other room. Okay. The, um, the tools that are here, each and every one of these things could have a lecture of their own, uh, if not a day-long session with them. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is this butter churn. Uh, a few years ago, looking through the Wayland collection, I noticed this churn and I was rather ecstatic to see it. When I was uh, in college, the college required that we do a trimester uh, off campus doing an internship. And I chose to work for the Washburn Northern's Living History Center in Livermore, Maine. And during their interview process, they have you come and live with at the museum for a three day living history event. and. At that event, we used a butter churn like this. And uh, I was really excited to see this in the basement. I said so to Molly, and she said, great. How soon can you do a talk on it? <laughs> um, 
And so we've sort of developed a talk about the tools and things from there. Now, you know, it's one thing to be familiar with tools and sort of have a connection to them, um, but it's another thing to really sort of understand them and know them. So, you know, back in 1988, when I first became acquainted with this uh, butter churn, I'm sure they told me all the ins and outs about it and all the history about it, but that was in 1988. And uh, other side having warm and fuzzy feelings about it, I really didn't know anything about it. So we have many of the other tools here. I had to do a little bit of research and hopefully I'll be able to tell you uh, what I found out about these tools. And uh, I may have some gaps in things, but in that, at the end of it, I'll try to answer some questions to the best of my ability. So what I learned about butter making was that before, say, uh, the 1400s, butter was made by putting it in a jar and shaking it. Uh, from about 1400 to 1800, um, they used the dash churn or the, um, I guess it's also called the, just a plunger churn. You know, it's the one we see in the, the um, it's just that cylindrical barrel that's a little tapered on top and it's got the rod on top and people press it up and down to make butter. And people use those churns for about 400, 500 years. You can actually take somebody from the, the 1500s and, you know, pop them down in colonial, colonial America and they would know how to make butter with the current technology of the time. There really wouldn't be any problem with it. Um, after that plunger style, they developed what was called a box or barrel style. And the first one was actually a barrel that was sort of turned on its side, a lot like a composter that we use today. It had some baffles inside, and as the, the milk moved through those baffles, the butter particles would form together and become a solid. Um, the problem with the barrels turning on their sides was that you had to a little small opening in the side to look inside to see if it was done. It also made it hard to retrieve the butter. It made it hard to clean out. Uh, it took them about 40 or 50 years to develop a barrel that would actually turn end to end. So you could actually open up one end of the barrel instead of having to go through the porthole on the side. Um, so that was actually developed in about the 1880s. Um, when they went on to industrial butter making, they actually went back to the dash or pipe style. Upstairs, but it's not really, I thought somehow. So the dash and some, you you'd see pictures of dash and style churns um, used with steam operations um, or even water driven operations where they'd have 20 or 30 of the plunger churns set up side by side. For small source butter making around 1850 or so, they started using what was known as box butter churns. These are two great examples here. Um, this one is really nice. It does small batches. You'd only fill it up about two thirds full, um, but you can see through it. You can see what's going on inside of it. Uh, easy cranking mechanism, easy to clean, but once again, it's going to be small batches. This one's going to be a little bit larger, larger crank, still pretty easy to get inside. Um, a little bit harder to clean, but you can do larger batches with it. Butter making is something that um, takes a little bit of finesse. You have to do it gently, but consistently. If you do it too hard or too fast, instead of getting butter at the end, you're gonna have just basically yellow grease. And uh, I remember actually looking back on my notes from working at the museum, that there were times when wives would get back at their husbands by serving them this yellow grease in the morning rather than regular butter. It was sort of a, a little way of revenge. Ooh. So, moving on, the next thing that was kind of cool, was this foot warmer, um, something that we, you know, um, basically indoor heating is something we take too, entirely too much for granted. Uh, having heat in the car, having, you know, heat in every building that we go into. These were essential uh, before central heating. And this is one of the ways that you would actually keep warm uh, in worship house. This is how you'd keep warm in a buggy. Um, you actually may have to travel long distances by horse and your only heat might be a foot stove like this underneath the lap rope. Now, um, these were, I think, around uh, 1700. They were uh, sold for very small amount of money. Uh, they were just ubiquitous in the environment. Uh, one news source that I did find was that the first Roxbury Church banned them after 1744 when someone knocked one over and they lost about a third of the church to a fire. 
when I was at the museum, we did not use foot warmers just because of insurance reasons. And we did hold church uh, in the winter time. And um, it's really hard to sing when your teeth are chattering. Um, so that's kind of a neat item. This here, I'm gonna call this a Dietz lamp. Uh, this was the flashlight of the day from about 1850 onward. This was, let's see, we have a slightly better inside view here. Um, it has a reflective surface on the back side, a powerful lens on the front. These would run on whale oil, uh, signal oil, kerosene later on. Uh, signal oil was a combination of um, usually vegetable oil, which they called fruit oil. Sometimes it would have lard in it. Uh, sometimes it would be a mixture of kerosene in it. So um, the first time of this lamp being seen in print was in a 1950. Uh, down. Oh, down. Okay. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Actually, it was a 1960 Harper's Gazette. Uh, and it was a picture from the south of two soldiers holding one at night, uh, holding one each at night. Now, these basically, these were really neat because outside of the lens, uh, anyone with any kind of brazing or tinsmithing background could make one. Uh, everybody made these. And they came from a variety of shapes and sizes, various amounts of tiers of smokestack on the top. They were called basically a watchman's light. They were called a signal light. The reason why they were called a signal light is they had a little shutter that you could actually push across on the bottom so you could actually signal back and forth. Uh, this one here actually actually has a belt clip on it, so you can actually just set it on your belt so you'd be hands free. Um, in the cold weather, uh, people would actually put it on their belt, put their coats out around it, and they had a nice little fuel fire to keep them warm. If they were using whale oil, uh, the whale oil would actually get cold, sort of um, solidify in the colder temperatures. So most of these lamps have the um, the wick holders extend down into the fuel area so the flame end can actually melt the fuel to keep it liquid, which is kind of a neat thing. Now, the thing about these lamps is that people are still making them today. Uh, they were in regular use until about 1950, so you, you know, basically had a nice 100 year run. Uh, and you can still buy them on eBay, you can still buy them on Etsy. So it's just a kind of a neat thing that it, for me, it's sort of an antique but it's still current. So going on with the lamps, this one here, I actually found at 101 Pelham Island Road while I was growing up. This is a carbide lamp from uh, 1899. Um, I didn't know what it was at first. Uh, I knew there was a lamp of some kind. I couldn't figure out how the fuel worked. It was explained to me that it was a carbide lamp. And so I trundled down to uh, Post Road, um, not post road, but um, town line hardware and bought some carbide, which they sold at the time. I have no idea if they still sell carbide now. I put carbide in it, added water, lit it, and it was pretty exciting because there's this brilliant white light. Uh, it was fantastic. And then I found out why it had been abandoned in the barn at 101 because it actually started shooting flame out of the side of it. Uh, and uh, the idea of actually having something that had a gas uh, leak on fire in a metal container it made me rather nervous. So these were designed for bicycles, uh, for people who ride bicycles at night, because it was uh, very dangerous to ride bikes at night without any light. Uh, they stayed in use until about 1930. Uh, they were brought out to use again. Basically, they stayed in use until 1930. They were overtaken by uh, electric lights with batteries. Um, but they, people dust them, dusted them off and started using them again in World War II when batteries became scarce. Uh, downsides, this wonderful bright light is they did catch fire from time to time and occasionally they do explode. So uh, I think the kerosene or whale oil lamp is sort of a little bit of a safer way to go, uh, but it's not quite as bright. So, oops, sorry, but I found your solar lamp. The museum has just acquired a, uh, a small hog splitter. This came from Gleason Lane. It was excavated when the homeowner was putting in a new patio. Uh, 
basically when people were doing their own butchering on the farms, you didn't necessarily take the animals to slaughterhouse, most of the large farms around here did a lot of their own butchering. So they would have to use cleavers or hog splitters. Uh, these are relatively small. I mean, these would be used for um, right as you're doing, right before you do your finishing cuts. The larger hog splitters would be, uh, the blades would be about two or three times the size of this and the handle would be two to three feet in length. Uh, it takes a lot of work to swing a full size hog splitter. It was for basically breaking the carcass right down the backbone, so swinging it through the bone. Um, it was something that you would not want to use in a confined space. It's sort of a, you would want to have other people around because it's relatively dangerous swing something like that around. Uh, this is one of the few things that is not making much of a comeback. There are a few artisanal butcher shops that are using hog splitters, but most of these have actually been replaced with various types of saws. Can you hold saws. it up again so we can yeah. have a better look at it? Let me, I'm just going to enlarge it. Yeah, so this okay. is, you know, um, this is also from the Russell farm. During my lifetime, my father used to use this to break open Blue Hubbard squashes, which were his pride and joy. He used to grow these enormous Blue Hubbard squashes, and he would use the old cleavers to uh, render them edible. So it's kind of a neat, neat tool. The uh, next in our selection is a farrier's float, um, still being used today. This is a little bit of a more modern farrier's float. The fact that it's got edges on the side, it's got a raspy teeth in the middle, long handle so you can get into a horse's mouth. If a horse's teeth grow irregularly, they get a little bit long on the sides, the horse can't uh, basically break down enough of the feed so it passes through the digestive system without being um, fully absorbed by the horse. So you can you know, give it the regular amount of feed, but the horse is going to lose weight. You're not going to get the full amount of work out of it. So the farrier would actually grind the teeth down to a, a uniform level. Early floats were basically the same rasp that they would use to form the hooves. The problem with that, without having these edges on the side, is sometimes it would slide off of the horse's mouth. Um, and uh, this is a much safer way of doing it. And so this is basically equine, de equine dentistry. And when I've seen them used, once again, at the museum, you know, the horses seem to like it. There's some aspect of the vibration in the teeth that sort of tickled themselves. So this was actually pretty cool. The hay knife, which I've seen around a lot. You know, I figured this was something that was from a much earlier time. Um, this is basically how you, if you had hay stored in your barn, um, as the hay would settle, this is before baling, as the hay would settle, uh, it would um, condense quite a lot. And it would be hard to get the hay separated out to, to feed the animals. And because we haven't really been baling, uh, baling hay for a really long time, I figured this would go back, you know, two, three hundred years. But these were actually only developed in 1871 uh, up in Dresden, Maine. So it's a relatively recently made tool. And they came about late enough that um, the steel was relatively cheap and they didn't get repurposed for anything else. So you, basically you'd see these around in any old barn that's still functioning, you'll usually see a hay knife somewhere on the side of it. It was designed for right-handed people only, I'm afraid. And you would actually do a sawing motion, pressing down with the left hand, uh, a couple of vertical strips to pull the material out. So these were uh, sold for 50 cents a piece in 1879 in the Sears and Robot catalog. So hay baling actually, um, they started to bale hay in the 1850s, but the bales were around 250 pounds a piece. And it was just as people were moving more into urban areas and they were having trouble moving the loose hay into these areas. Uh, that they started to bail it, you know, and the, the top of the, um, the um, ability of bailing at that time was about five bales per hour, right, as far as, you know, so it was really slow, very dense, very hard to move around, but that was the, the peak industry of its time. Have you priced one of those today? Uh, I have not. Um, so far as I know, in almost every old barn I've been in, there's somebody offering you, to, you know, to take it away. Take away. Sort of fill up a lot of space. So with a lot of old farm tools, especially Yankee farm tools, they get repurposed over time. 
So this is a flail. These uh, aren't used very often anymore. Uh, and so, you know, it usually has a, use, a nice stout staff uh, and a nice bludger on the end. Uh, traditionally, way, um, eel skin was a nice way to attach them together. Uh, sometimes they'd have metal attachments at the end. But, you know, this is one of those tools that uh, would be repurposed as handles or, or firewood or something over time. So to actually have one is pretty neat. So this is what's called a corn flail. Um, you know, it's the English term of corn, so it was really used for wheat. And this was used, uh, started in Europe around 1400s. Before that, the way they actually thresh the grain was to take a, a heavy sledge and drive over the, the sheaves with oxen. Now you actually had the trouble with all the dirt that would be the oxen manure, separating all of those other things out. The flail was, you know, this incredible use of, of modern technology at the time. So you would have a winnowing area, you would have a, a group of beaters around the edge of it. You choose an area where there's a nice breeze. And as you beat the end of the bludger down onto the uh, grain, the chaff would fly up and drift off of the breeze. So, so you'd separate the wheat from the chaff. Um, we use these up on the museum mostly as bean flails. Uh, we had a nice area that had a, a, a nice draft in the barn where the two doors, our north and south door, we would use them to separate shell beans. Um, is that a piece of leather that's tied these together? Let, let's have, yeah, so let's, this is just a, a, a couple of leather tongs. Down a little bit lower? Oh. There you go, okay. And so we've got a couple of these in the collection. This is the one that seems to be in the best condition. Um, this was basically replaced in the 1830s with an actual mechanical threshing machine. Uh, the, some of the smaller farms and other areas still use the flail for small household gardens. Uh, or if they, you know, they had small batches, but the threshing machine was really the way to go. Uh, the person who had a threshing machine would just basically do a round of different farms. It would stop at one farm for one period of time, and all the farmers in the area would actually bring all of their grains to that farm, have it threshed right on site. Uh, the threshing machines were rather big and bulky. Uh, some of them were run by horsepower using a, a basically a large treadmill with horses on it. It wasn't exactly something that moved around a lot. But you know, they basically choose a, a run of large farms and just run the pressure through that, that area. Um, so some of the fun stuff we've got here today is we have some augers. And the augers, you know, this is something that I've been I've been using augers like this. Uh, for the last 30 years or so, but I never really looked into the history of them. So this is kind of fun for me. You know, these basically date back to use in Roman times. And this one has a fixed handle on it, but some would actually have a, a little sleeve at the top. And so if you were, you know, you're cutting through hardwood or you're cutting through something that's very dense and you needed more help, you could add a longer handle onto it so you get better leverage, or you could do it with another person. So you'd have two people to turn the auger down into the ground, into the wood or ground or whatever you're using it on. The, um, the other one we have here is actually a bunghole auger. It has a little tap screw down at the bottom and then it has a tapered cutting edge so that you can actually decide how large the hole needs to be. So this would either be you know, for putting a cork or a bung uh, spile in for a barrel very important for a cooper to have. Uh, may not be something that you'd have on a regular farm, so it's a little bit more of a technical tool. <clears throat> so the bits and bracers, which actually fall into the same category as our augers as, as drilling tools, uh, the first brace bit was designed in uh, Flanders between 1420 and 1430. Uh, before that, people used basically a bone drill. Uh, these really didn't change much over the next 400 years. The, uh, the original ones would have a single bit that would be permanently attached to it. Uh, as it went over the next, over that 400 year period, they did design them so that you could put different bits in it. Uh, and they did actually um, brace them a little bit with more metal, more brass around the edges so they'd be able to take a little bit more force that it allowed you to put pressure on a drill bit as you turned in to the wood. These, um, 
adapted over time, as soon as we started to get an access to uh, inexpensive, good quality steel, the patents on these blew up. Uh, all over America, there was basically uh, everyone who had an idea for a pit and bracer, they actually made one of their own. Uh, they made them so that the first, actually the first round of them, they all had their own drill bits that they would take and no one else's. So it was very uh, monopolized. But later on, they started to design them so you could actually put anybody's drill bit in your chuck. So it sort of took advantage of the market in that way. Uh, Around 1830, the newest technology came out in one of these drills. The neat thing about this is it's gear driven. You can actually change the speed of the drill. You could actually brace it against your chest while you're using it, guide it with one hand, drill with the other hand. This would allow you to get up to speeds that made it actually comfortable to cut through metal. So it's a little, little bit more efficient than using just a regular bit and bracer. This is an adaptation also of the bit and bracer. This is the one that was, uh, if you're of a certain age, this is what you saw in shop class. Uh, everybody's house had piles of these. If you go to flea markets, there's gonna be a bin of these someplace. These are a ratcheting bit. This one here was made in Miller's Falls, so it's relatively local to us. It would allow you to basically work in tighter areas because you just work it one way and ratchet it back and forth. Um, pretty neat tool. And then these basically, if you were doing small projects, the bit and braces were great. The large projects where you may have been using a T-handled auger, such as barn building or any kind of house building, you might switch over to a mortising mortising machine. Uh, this is a uh, mortising machine where you can actually change the angle of the uh, where the bit goes into the wood. A lot of these came out where they were just at a straight right angle. We're just doing straight mortise and tendons on it. This one gives the advantage of doing a little bit more complicated work. Um, most of these actually have a little clasp on top which actually holds the, the apparatus in the upright position. You would be able to basically, once you have it in the downright position, you could use both arms to drill it in. You would sit on the saddle with your legs to either side. So you'd have it right over a beam. So your body weight is going to hold it in place. And let's see here. Take that down. It goes down into the bottom position. When you're ready, oh, let me actually move back up. There's a little latch where you can actually move back into the upright position. So you can move it up, slide it over, drop it down, drill. When you've got it at the bottom of the hole, you can shift the little gear over and then pull it back up to get it out of the hole. So this was kind of a neat thing. And this is, uh, these arrived on the scene around 1830. Uh, this one, as near as I can tell, is similar to the Snell brand from about 1850. Um, a little bit more of a specialized tool, not gonna be sort of the tool that you would find in every uh, craft house, uh, croft house, but it would be something you would find to someone who's been building a lot of barns, you might find one in any neighborhood. So let's see, did I miss anything with our mortising machines? Um, so planes, planes are kind of an interesting subject. We have a collection of multiple use planes. Uh, we have probably enough planes downstairs to just do planes. Um, I brought up a small selection of planes today. Um, these combinate these sorts of planes here, which are going to do uh, mullions, they're going to do rabbits, they're going to do um, you know window panes, door frames, things of that nature. They would really belong only to somebody who specialized in that type of work. You wouldn't find it in the average household. It's the same way if you're building a house today. The contractor who builds your house is going to send out for the windows and doors. He's not going to make them himself in most cases. You know, so building windows and doors in the olden times are the same as today. It's really a specialized craft with specialized tools. Uh, most of these in a lot of home workshops can be replaced by a router, uh, or you can get um, there are planes that do combination cuts. 
Uh, but with these, you have to make you know individual ones, uh, an individual type of plane for each type of cutting you're going to be doing. Now, there's probably without getting into the technical differences of planes, there's probably about 19 or 20 different types of planes in general. Uh, anything from a jack plane, which would be for basically leveling out a warped board. Um, you know, it just takes the high points off until you get it down flat to something like a block plane, which is going to work for end grain, uh, or just when you need to take a little bit off in, in various places. Um, one thing that I actually found out in researching for this today was that I look at a plane that's made out with a wood body, like, oh, this must be an antique. But all of the Roman planes were actually made of metal. Uh, so the, the wooden planes are sort of a little bit more of a modern construction than the antique, but really real antique planes. And uh, a lot of the modern Japanese planes are also wooden body as well. So it goes, it depends on the culture and it depends on use. And I suppose it probably depends on the resources and raw materials in a given area. So to make the windows, for instance, the um, mullions, um, would they be uh, all different shapes? They'd come in all different shapes or you need several they planes? They would be different shapes uh, depending on the scale of the mullions you're making. Oh, okay. So you might have a window maker in a particular area who specializes in one style of mullions, but he may have a couple of different planes if you want to have a little bit of larger mullions, uh, depending on how big a piece of glass you're putting in there and how much structure you're going to need to support it. Great. So Thank it, you. Um, and it's the same thing for making doors, mm -hmm. um, making any kind of drawers. Uh, it's all going to be specialized. Mm -hmm. It gets, gets a little complicated. Mm -hmm. The other thing that really excited me when I found it in the basement, um, and it's sort of the thing that was may have attracted some of you to come here, is that the basement had a beetle. Now this one is a little bit oh. bigger than a lot of them out there. Uh, this one's been reinforced with iron bands. And they've actually reinforced the inside of it with iron wedges. So this is may have started off as a beetle or a commander, um, but it has been retrofitted over the years to become more of a sledgehammer. It, um, some of the earlier ones that were round, they would actually cut little grooves in it and then wrap it with wire. So if they're using a softwood head, it wouldn't split through continuous use. If you're looking at some of the more modern ones, if they're doing a post and beam construction project, they might use a section of a timber that they're waste timber, you know, cut it off square, drill a hole in it, put a handle in it, and yay, you've got a commander for the day. Um, commanders and beetles, also known as persuaders, they come in all shapes and sizes. There is no standard size. It all depends on the project you're doing on that given day, who's making it, uh, upper body strength, the length of, of the distance of the project that they're working on from you know where they're standing. Um, they're often used to draw, uh, basically push the pegs into a million and, um, tenon, mortise and tenon mortise and tenon structures. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, and it is one of those situations where you do want to put a square peg into a round hole. Uh, it actually is a tighter bond if you put a round peg into a round hole as it shrinks. It actually gets loose and will fall out. Uh, but you might have a smaller beetle just for pounding the pegs in, and a larger beetle for moving the big beams around. Um, so this one is actually pretty neat. Uh, I imagine the earliest beetles were basically just a, a tree trunk that had a branch coming off at a certain point, so you just cut it, and you've got a you know on the spot commander. Can you just move the um, thing in front of it so that people can see it? And I'll try and enlarge it so they can see the end of it that you were pointing at. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Oops. So this one's a pretty good sized beast. I'd say it's in the 30, 35 pound range. Thank you. Um, I would not want to swing this all day. I don't think I'd want to swing this a whole lot. I think this is basically. Uh, uh, this would be terrible for my back, I think. <laughs> so now that we're basically looking at the beetle and the commander, we've been dealing with blunt force objects. Um, from there, that takes us on to axes. And one of the things that's kind of neat about the Wayland collection 
you know, these are somewhat pitted. They're not tools that can be, a lot of these aren't tools that can be taken out and be used today. But with a lot of farm collections, I was talking about earlier with a flail is that most of the tools get repurposed over time. Uh, people look at Russell's Garden Center and someone's been a farm for a really long time. He must have really great tools there uh, left over from way back from before. And most of the tools we've got there have, you know, they've disappeared. They've, you know, lost the handle, the head became something else. That handle became a shaft for something. Um, we took that head and we used that as a wedge for something else. Uh, everything sort of grows as it's, you know, and when it comes to a point where it can't be used anymore, it gets left in the corner. It becomes, you know, a block of rust, um, you know, or firewood or whatever, depending on its, its use or what it was made out of. So this is kind of nice. We get a little peek into the past through these tools. Um, but as we're getting into something, you know, as I told you, the commanders and the beetles are something that's being used right now. Um, the axes, the planes, most of these tools are things you could go out to Garrett and Wade a woodworking catalog and find something just like this uh, in brand spanking new condition and go out and do timber framing. So in our axe category, I'm going to actually pull these up for you to see a little bit here. And then put them down again. So this is considered to be a single bit axe. It's got um, bevel on both sides on this particular one. It's a little chopping hatchet, actually. And um, for axes, looking at single bit and double bit, where you've got the blade on the other side, without getting into the technical heads, there's probably about 42, 43 styles floating around of different types of chopping and splitting axes. Uh, getting into the te technical heads, we're getting into the broad axes, uh, like this one here. This one here, it's not a broad axe. This one's actually beveled on both sides. A broad axe is only beveled on one side. Uh, both of these tools here would be used for heavy timber, light timber, heavy timber construction. If you had a log and you wanted to make it into a beam, you have to square it off. So you would actually take a marking line from one end of the log to the other end and you'd snap it. Uh, we use blue clay in these modern days. They might use something like uh, just a regular clay powder. They might use berry dye on a string uh, to make those marking lines. And then you would take an ax and you would chop it at intervals down the log. Cut out little grooves, maybe a foot to a foot and a half, of, yeah, maybe a foot apart. So it'd be little notches in there. And then you take a broad ax, you'll notice from the angle here, you can see it, it's got the handle that's not straight on the blade. You could actually, you could actually do this while the uh, log is sort of on the side, but you would go down the log and you would chop off those sections in between those little grooved out sections that you chopped up. Now that would give you a very rough square beam. Um, it's pretty fun to do. Uh, I've done that for my, one of my father's houses in Vermont. Uh, we squared up all the beams by, by hand. Um, something that's fun to do at least once, maybe once. Um, the axes and hatchets. Uh, there's as many axes and hatchets as there are things that you might need them for. There are roofing hatchets. There are you know various types of splitting hatchets. There are different axes for um, making tenons. There are axes for making fence posts. There are axes for making the, the tenons and fence posts to fit the rails. Um, so there's also, if you have any type of thing you're making, pre-electricity, there's probably an ax that was devised specifically to do that job. Um, the other thing is that, you know, go into a hardware store today and you look at the axes, they're usually gonna be like 28 inches long, which is sort of a, a sort of a camp ax. And then they're going to be, you know, 30 inches, 32, 30, and maybe you might find one 36 inches. Axe handles used to be made by the person usually using the axe, and uh, it was really important to fit the axe to the person using it. You really didn't go with the standard lengths. Uh, a splitting axe might be about two inches longer than a chopping axe. And if, you know, if anyone has questions about how you might measure an axe for a person, we can, we can approach that at the end if anyone is even curious. 
but you know, an axe is sort of a personal thing. Um, you know, most houses pre-electricity usually had a chopping hatchet in the backyard just for cutting kindling from wood stove uh, just to keep things going. Probably had a splitting axe as well, maybe a maul, maybe wedges, just to keep things interesting. So the other blunt force object we're going to talk about, or one of the other blunt force objects, is an adze. And adzes don't seem to get quite as much modern use as axes do, but they are also something that come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Uh, this here is a Cooper's adze. It's got you know almost no handle at all. Uh, this would be used inside of a almost finished barrel to sort of uh, level out the staves to make sure that you can get that last metal band around the top uh, or doing any glass smoothing work just to make sure you don't have splinters or anything in it. Um, once we've got our beam roughed out with our broad axe, we might use an adze along the top of it uh, just to basically swing and, and cut. If you're doing anything that needs any kind of grooving, we might use an adze that has a rounded blade. If we're making any kind of a wooden shovel, wooden bowls, or like a dough bowl, once again, you'd use a small hand adze. Uh, there's also a, a type of ha small hand adze that has the, the rounded edge on it. It's called a scorp. And you'd usually use that to hollow out bowls and large, you know shovels and types of things. So that's kind of a neat thing. And then the other blunt floor splitting object we have is called a fro. Um, this is really sort of a tool that you'd see a lot in New England. It would be all over the place. These were used basically for splitting wood with control. So basically you'd have a, a round of wood and set the fro on top of it. And you would beat the edge into the wood uh, the best thing to use would be a, a mallet made from hooker, hickory, uh, preferably from a taproot, very dense wood with a, a, you know, a very um, complicated grain, so it wouldn't split easily. And with the fro, you can actually, as it's being pushed down into the grain of the wood, you have control with your left hand to control where the blade's going to go. So you can, as you're cutting your shingles, you can make sure that you're not making it too thick or too narrow. And you can, when you get down to the end, you can sort of pop them off. Um, Is it a throw or a fro? A fro. F. F R O E. Okay, thank you. Uh, and these, these have actually made a comeback as well. So we're still seeing these being actively used. Uh, I'm not seeing people make them out of leaf sprays. So, you know, still a rather current product. The other thing you can use a fro for is if you're making uh, an axe handle, or you're making basically any kind of wooden handle, and you have a a wooden blank, basically a log section, you can actually use the, the fro to control how thick the slabs you're going to be cutting off are going to be. Um, and it just gives you a little bit more control than you'd normally get with an axe or using wedges, like using wedges or anything of that nature. Uh, down to, so it gets us down into wood saws. And when I left Sterling College to go work at the Washburn Northern's Living History Center, uh, after I'd completed my time at Sterling, I mean, that's the sort of thing you do once you've graduated from school with a background in, in draft horse management and um, low impact forestry, and that you actually know how to sharpen crosscut saws, which is a rather specialized skill. So this is probably um, from the Nine, sometime in the 1900s. Um, it's kind of, you can tell by the teeth pattern. This has actually got a peg shaped tooth and an M shaped tooth combined. This is called the champion uh, tooth pattern. It's one of the more efficient tooth patterns. Basically, you can go right back again to Roman times, and there'll be basically just a plain tooth pattern on the Roman saws. Uh, they were used. Not as frequently by the Romans. They used usually smaller saws. 
Um, they gained in popularity in Europe around the 1500s or so. We have pictures of them in the New World, uh, 1635, I think, and 1681. There's two, two different pictures of them. They were uh, used primarily just for bucking trees once they've been felled. So once the tree is on the ground and you've trimmed off the branches with your axe, you would use one of these two land saws to cut it into lengths. And it wasn't actually until the 1880s in Pennsylvania that someone thought, hey, we can use these to cut down trees with which is sort of an interesting idea because up until then you would cut a wedge out of the front of the tree and then you cut the back of the tree with the ax and drop the tree. The problem with doing that is that you lose a lot of the wood around the base of the tree because you're cutting out two sections of notches and the wide wood of the tree is all down at the bottom of it. You know, you can preserve a little bit of that wood then with a sharp saw it can go a little bit faster. And it is a two-man operation. Um, these saws are the ultimate in cooperation. Uh, you have to work well with your partner. You cannot push the saw or it will bind. You cannot, as you're working with the saw, you cannot pull it past your body because it will bind. You cannot push down on the saw because it has a tendency to bind. Um, there's usually a lot of swearing when breaking a new partner with crossfit <laughs> saws. Uh, they do have the nickname of Misery Whip in various areas of Maine and uh, Northern Vermont. But when you get uh, two people who actually work well together and can develop a nice pace and a pattern, it is beautiful to watch. It is just uh, absolutely magnificent. Uh, these saws are still available today. People, you know, any lumberjack roundup is gonna have a crosscut saw competition. The people who are competing in those competitions, they'll have the high carbide steel blades, um, you know, beautiful, beautiful saws. But it's still going to be based on this tooth pattern. And actually, I should tell you a little let's, bit let's about Let's look that. at that again, because it's so picturesque when you look at it up close. Let me see. There we go. So this tooth pattern, it's got the two plain teeth, and then it has an M tooth. So the two plain teeth are bent away from each other. And what they do is they cut the grains of the wood on either side of the kerf. And then this M tooth, tooth comes along and it actually scrapes those cut fibers of wood out of the cut. Hmm. There's a gap on either side of the M tooth and that's where the sawdust and those cut fibers hang out until they get to the side of the log and get dumped on the ground. Um, and there's a whole science actually getting just the right amount of bend to the top of these teeth so you, don't, so you can just cut right into the wood. There's going to be different cutting, um, sharpening patterns, whether you're cutting hardwood or you're cutting softwood. Uh, in different parts of the world, there's going to be different depths that you're going to sharpen them to. But they're really quite fun. If you go to a hardware store and you buy a bow saw, or if you buy, you know, any kind of a camp saw, this is the pattern it's going to have. It's really the most efficient pattern out there. Most people aren't going to have a two-man crossfit saw. I mean, some people did, but the more common saw that you would find, and this is the saw that was used, you know, by Romans and all the way through time and history, is basically going to be something along the lines of a frame saw. Now, this is a really simple, well, simple except that it has a really nice handle on it. Uh, a really simple one wouldn't actually have the handle, it would just be the saw held between the two frames, uh, a tension rod on the top, and uh, this has just a plain tooth pattern for cutting back and forth. But most of the firewood cutting, most of the you know, timber making would be used for the frame saw. Um, there are some that will actually have the tension on either side with a saw blade in the middle for cutting various projects. Um, but it's nice, simple construction. You can put, you know, aside from the fancy handle, you can put one of these buck saws together in about a day. And you know, I've seen situations where people even have just taken rough metal and made their own, you know, filed their own teeth into it. You know, to have that true experience of doing it from start to finish. And then the last saw that we're going to look at today is the ice saw. Mm. So this is big and aggressive uh, and scary looking. It's all plain teeth. Um, cutting ice isn't a real fancy thing. Uh, you know, keeping it sharp. Is you know it's going to be a little bit easier to do the filing on this is a lot easier to do than actually a wood cutting saw. 
this has a hole at the top where you slide a piece of wood through it. And with the wood, it's going to be, this is basically the tiller. So you can lean on the tiller to change the direction of the saw as you're cutting it through the ice. I did get the chance to cut ice once while I was at the museum. <clears throat> and uh, it was a pretty neat project to do, uh, to get people, we had a couple of people out on the ice. We cut out these long channels on one side and then cut vertically, you know, horizontally across from that. It was per perpendicular. So we get a pattern. And after you cut the blocks free, you float them down to where the sledge is, and you take the ice tongs, get a good grip on the ice block, and the secret is that you actually don't lift it. You're gonna get a hernia if you go around lifting blocks of ice. <laughs> You'd actually push down on the block of ice as hard as you can into the water, and the buoyancy of the ice will be driven back up by the water, and then you just lift it up onto the sledge from there. Um, when moving it around on the ice, you just slide it on the ice. When moving it in the sledge, you slide it on the, on the sledge. Uh, the museum, we would pack the ice in sawdust, and the ice would last at the museum, you know, through the main summers, right up until we actually were cutting ice the next year. So the ice, just packing stuff in sawdust and just using little, you know, chipping off little blocks of ice from time to time was enough. Now, the um, flail, any kind of barn building activities using the ice saw, um, butter, butter making in some situations, a lot of these tasks were social tasks. These are things you couldn't do by yourself. With you know, cutting ice, there might be two or three people in the neighborhood who had ice saws. Not everybody would have ice saws. You don't need everybody to have ice saws. But when you went and cut ice, you cut ice for the entire neighborhood. And you wouldn't stop until everyone's ice house was full. You know, when you're doing threshing, you don't stop until everybody's done with their threshing. Um, and while you're waiting for things to get up, it would be a time for people to socialize, it would be a time for shared meals, um, it would be a time for you know, people to catch up on news that they didn't otherwise hear. I mean, it was basically a time when we didn't have radio and we didn't have all of the electronics, so people were a little bit more social when they had a chance. It was a pretty neat community aided activity. Everybody would think that would fit in quite well today, wouldn't it? I, <laughs> We'd all like to get social. I know. <laughs> I'm ready to throw my iPhone out the window. Right. So this basically wraps it up. I'd like to thank you all for zooming in with us today. And I'd like to open the floor to questions. Yeah, don't go anywhere, Jack. There's and loads will, of them. I will answer any questions okay. that I can, but I can't make any promises. Well, we'll, we'll try. Um, I think some of it would be nice if um, people could talk to you. There are, there are many from, um, that are very amusing. Oh, good. From oh, good. a good friend of yours, I guess. Uh, Ted first, is that right? Fused, first, yeah. fused? Okay, the one thing that he wants to know is about the, um, oh, where was that? It was so amusing, I loved it. Um, I would like to formally ask you at the end to tell us how to make take the measure of a man via his ax, or oh. is it to make the ax to fit the measure of a man? <laughs> it is gonna be the ax to fit the measure of a man. <laughs> right. And it would be for someone to stand as you normally would. And you can't really see the ground here, but you can see where my hand is beside. And this is basically, with, I'm using the um, ads handle as an example. And if you can see where the handle comes up to my palm of my hand, uh -huh. this would be a good length for a splitting ax. If it's going to be a chopping axe, I only want it to come up to the second digit of my middle finger. So it's about three inches too long. Somebody else asked about um, safety of all this equipment. How, I mean, was that ever a, a topic or something that people worried about or told their family members about? You know, the, this was all uh, the modern technology of the time. This was the best the technology had to offer. And, you know, it's sort of like people might look back at us driving around in automobiles and didn't then even worry about crashing. Um, there were certainly accidents that happened. Uh, there was one story in Maine that uh, there's a gentleman who was injured on building a barn and lost his leg. He was replaced with a peg leg and, you know, it was people sung his praises as the fastest corn planter all around because he could use the peg leg. But you know, amputations were a regular thing. 
medicine was something, you know, we weren't going to have penicillin for quite some time. Um, infection could be an, an amputation. Mm -hmm. And it was just part of the way of life. I'm not sure that there's uh, any extra concern. concern right. um, your friend Ted also said that um, they banned those round, big round bales in Wisconsin because they were afraid the cows would not get a square meal. <laughs> um, maybe that we should uh, go back to um, let people talk. I'm, I'm going to yeah. have to. Yeah, go ahead. And I'm going to have to um, unmute people. I've got to figure out how to do that. All right. Come on, let's go. Unmute. How do I unmute? Maybe, oh, they're all do, unmuting themselves. Go okay. for it. Everybody can unmute themselves. Why don't you have them raise their hand and then you can just call them? Yeah. All righty. Whoops. Oh, there we go. Uh, Lucia Thompson has a question. Hey, Jack. Hey, Lucia. <laughs> Thaddeus is here. Well, he wants to show you his um, frustrator. <laughs> okay, he's gonna, Jack's going to have to come around here. <laughs> Don't. It's, it's, yeah, I won't hit Lucia in the head with it. It's got some weight. Oh, my goodness. That is awesome. Yeah. So, I, Jack, I, I apologize. I missed your presentation because I was working on a home construction project. Uh, but, well, but I heard something about uh, tools in the background. I was like, Lucia's listening to something about tools. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all um, been taped, and so we will um, have Excellent. it up on the website at some point. We have so, one more question, Jack. You're going to have to come back to the camera. Yeah, Jack. Jack I have two things. One, uh, one. I've got this massive clamp. Yeah. And uh, it sort of screws in, and I don't know if it had. It's very dusty. I don't know if there's a particular use you're aware of. Uh, and then another question I had is, my father had this uh, great big thing that looked like a seesaw. And you, um, you sat on it and you pulled this thing back and forth, which was a lot of fun when we were kids, but I have no idea what it was for. And I don't know if it sounds at all familiar to you. Um, it sounds like a shaving horse of some sort. Yeah, that sounds like it would make sense. A clamp system for, you know, basically being able to use a draw knife or a spoke shape, um, basically for smoothing out handles or any kind of rod. Uh, those are mostly used for, but I mean, you can use a shaving horse for anything. It's basically a clamp you can sit on. Um, as far as the, the other clamp you showed me, it's like basically any kind of C clamp you'd get at the hardware store today. You just hold it for anything you need to hold together. So you can use, yeah, <laughs> anything you <laughs> no, need no, to hold no. together. Thank you, Thaddeus and Lucia. Thank right. you, Jack. Um, John, John Beard. Yes. Jack, um, I got to say just one word about your background, and that has to do with the fact that your dad was the architect of our vacation home in Swans Island, Maine. That's I right. learned only fairly recently that Jack participated in a small way in, in high school in helping to build that house. I got it right? Yes, you do. Uh, I love it. That's great. Thank um, you very much. That's a beautiful house. The, uh, a gorgeous house. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> we would love, love to show it sometime. Um, in the yellow house, you may remember on the property there on Swans Island, I found a tool that I think I can describe to you. And I've asked a lot of people what it was, but they haven't been able to tell me what it is. Here's the description. It's a rod, uh, call it 12 to 15 feet long, looped at the end about uh, inch diameter steel, and it has welded to it at intervals of about 18 inches, cross um, L-shaped pieces. And I've got a theory as to what it was used for, but have you ever heard of such a thing? No. Nobody, in, nobody on Swans Island has ever seen one or, or heard of one. Picture next time. Yeah, I would love to see a picture of that, John. 
why don't you come over here and I'll turn it back to, um, then they can really talk to you. All right. And see you. Um, where are we? Oh, here. Oops. There you go. Okay. Um, I, I can tell you what my theory is on what it was used for. Oops. Which what? <laughs> Am I taking more than my share of the time here? I'm sorry. Um, uh, oh, that's theory. The theory is that um, a workman would tie a line to the loop end of this long rod and um, throw the line over the roof of a house and oh. tie the line down on the ground on the opposite side from where he's doing a roof. Right. And then use that ladder type of thing for boards to hold himself and his materials. That is a possibility. Most of those sorts of things I've ever seen have, have been made out of wood and usually, you know, used as a short term pro you know, you make it for the project and then at the end of the project, you break it down and throw it away. Yep. So it'd be into, I'd love to see the picture and see if it, it is a real possibility. I'll try to find one. I gave it to the library at Swan's Island uh, as a project for the children to try to identify. <laughs> and another project was for them to go uh, talking to everybody around the village to see if they could find anybody who knew what it was. And they they couldn't come up with anything. Not yet. That's great. Not yet. Um, so I we have to scroll through here to see if anybody else wants to talk or else somebody can shout out. Um, I know Jano pointed out that the um, the, the horse uh, teeth filing thing is quite, is very similar to what's used today to float horses' teeth. It is. It's very. It's yeah. um, it's the fact that we actually have it down there. I mean, a lot of the things that we've absorbed as part of our collection is you know people are cleaning out garages or cleaning out barns, and you know we have stuff down there that's not very antique at all. It's something just you know the last 40 or 50 years. I mean, it, some of that stuff will be an antique someday, but it's not exactly an antique yet. I mean, one of the things we can do is we can sort of look at the things that are around us and determine what future generations are gonna decide are antiques. Right. Molly, do you see other questions or here? I didn't read through all of the chat either. There were lots of them. Uh, one, one question was about the bunghole maker. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, was, could that have been used in maple sugaring? Uh, uh, put taps in. To put taps oh. in? Yeah, no, that. it's really more of the, um, just for, so those taps, you'd actually just, um, you just bang them in, a spile right? in, but this bunghole is just for basically barrels. Okay. So one question I saw on there was, were there any sides in the basement? And yes, there's actually um, at least one, if not two sides down there. Um, they're a little difficult to bring up the stairs. So I kind of left them there and I figured we had enough tools for the top. But the um, using a side is, um, it's awesome once you get the hang of it. There's a little bit of a learning curve to it. There's competitions in Switzerland every year where they actually have a person with a side complete, compete against somebody with a gasoline mower. Hmm. An area, I think it's about maybe six feet wide and like a hundred yards long. And the person with the side wins every single year. So when you have someone who can wield the side effectively, it's gonna be a very, very efficient tool. Um, and they're a lot of fun to use. But that being said, it is a, a, a bit of a learning curve. And it's you know, different muscles than what we use for anything else. What's that top one there? Somebody said, um, how do you play in a rabbit? Answer, carefully. Carefully. <laughs> carefully, but only if you can catch the rabbit. All right. Okay, that was Ted again. I said, we had a damn this Ted fella. All right. <laughs> That's Let's it pretty see. much, yeah. I didn't see anybody sleeping. I think that's a fantastic round of applause for Jack. Um, it's just great. He really uh, kept it going. 
So, I mean, if anyone has ever has questions going forward, you know where to find me. I'll be here in town. And uh, thank you all for coming. This is great. Oh, thank you so much, Jack. Uh, thank you, Jack. Thank you. Richard. Thank you. Get all yep. that. <laughs> yep. I found this one here. Thanks so much Bravo. for all of you showing up. Yes, thank you for showing up in this crazy time. Right. Zooming right. in, as it were. Right. And Molly has a list, right? I do. I think we had 51 participants at some yeah. point. Yes. So, yeah. We did. We did. Thank great. you. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, everyone, for coming today. This is great. Thank and you. John, you've got me. Um, I'm really thinking about that tool, and I'm going to have to figure it out for you. <laughs> OK, thank you. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> All righty. Bye, everyone. Have Good a great day. Day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk. Um, let me just stop the recording. Stop. OK. Yeah. I've stopped the recording. I wanted to, I just want you to be able, before I turn it off, just yeah. to see all those chat things, because they were, some of them were very amazing. I'm going to keep this going if you want to all talk. I want Jack, uh, Jack to be able to see all the comments, because they were yeah. very amazing. <laughs> I just saved the comments and emailed them to Jack. Oh, you did? Oh, oh thank Lucia. you. Oh, wow. thank you. Oh, Lucia, that's great. Okay. But in case well, I did it wrong, you should still.